wind up being the ruling class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. I brought in the, I asked you to kind of think along those lines. It's really striking, and I'm just going to drop this and we're going to move on. But whenever you, whenever you realize that the very framers of that document, uh, you know, the Cambridge Flat Platform, were very strongly influenced by the, the forms of civil and ecclesiastical government that Calvin had established in Geneva. And then you look at the general shape of our Republican government as it was originally established here in the United States. There's some really neat stuff going on there. And Steve Lawson would contend that very much our form of government was patterned after what Calvin had accomplished in Geneva. But anyway, the practicality of this form of government is that it, it avoids the tyranny of the chaos that can often begin to be a characteristic of Congregationalism. This is Congregationalism as it was originally intended by those who came out of the, uh, in, in England, the the, the, what? the Anglican Church, the Anglican Church in England. This is this is what their intention was for a congregational church that bled over into the New World, and really this is our heritage. And like we were talking about at lunch, so much of the error in the church today is could be traced back to the fact that we simply don't know our history. We don't know where we came from. What did you start to say, Dan? Yeah, yeah. That even though ultimately it is the church that that makes those determinations concerning the erring brother or, or the, the, the one who is left, even then Christ that's the presides of yeah. two or three gathered together, Christ right. is directly involved. That's right. Uh, leading and, and directing the hearts if they're submitted yeah. they should be. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and the condition there is is that we be in agreement in accordance with his name, which represents all that he is. So, so you really have that overarching authority of Christ and the Father overarching everything all flows uphill to that. And, and then there's the checks and balances that result between an informed congregation, as Carl was saying, and a faithful leadership within the church. And when those three are working in unison, congregationalism is a beautiful thing. But you let one of them get out of balance, like Harry was talking about, and people begin to overemphasize the authority of the congregation, or you let a tyrannical pastor begin to overemphasize the authority of the pastor, or a group of deacons, which is so common in Baptist churches, you get any of those three out of kilter, you got problems and you've got chaos. So 
Dever says congregationalism viewed as a pure democracy can lead to decisional chaos. I love the way he puts things. Decisional chaos, he says. Congregationalism understood biblically does not mean that the whole congregation has to vote on every single decision. Biblically what it means is, is that the congregation is the final appeal in certain matters. You will notice one of the things that we did in moving our business meeting from once every 30 days to one time a year is we, we basically took out all of the superficial stuff that we were yang yang about in these every 30 day conferences that everybody get a knot in their stomach about. We just took them out of the picture and said, okay, we're only going to deal with certain issues. Do you realize your leadership was exercising these very principles that we're talking about here? You see, if the congregation has to vote on every single thing, it opens all kinds of doors to chaos within the body proper. Dever does a good job here in this particular section in, in, in that he breaks down the decision making of the church into four specific areas. I want you to get this. He says there's four specific areas or categories of decision making that take place within a church. He said there are those issues that are number one, clear but not serious. Clear but not serious. These are usually the decisions uh, where there's really not any need for discussion. It's clear what needs to be done and you just do it. You know, an example of this would be, should we maintain the appearance of our building? Okay? Now, do you understand that right here in this church, right here where you sit, there was a time we had to take a vote on whether or not to paint the exterior of the building when it, the paint was peeling off the got big and boards. That's silly. There are a certain category of issues like that that are clear what needs to be done and it's not a biblical issue it's not a serious issue dadgummit just do it okay there's a whole category he said there's a second tier of issues that are both serious and clear I'm sorry that are neither serious I got it backwards on my thing here. That are neither serious or clear. On these matters, he says, congregational discussion is defined, or, or is fine, but should not be intense or drawn out. An example of that would be is deciding whether or not we need to have lunch between our morning worship and our discipleship. Oh, uh, you know. It's not a serious issue, and there's no clear biblical mandate on what we should do. But obviously, we need to discuss it as a congregation, but it doesn't need to take four hours to sort it out. That's one category. That's another category. Go ahead. Could we possibly ask at this point, is that where the color of the carpet would come into play? That's actually the very example that he used. <laughs> he used the carpet thing, but I'm so sore about that right now, I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> That was a huge issue. Then there is that category of issues that are both serious and clear, he says. On these matters, he said, there should be decisional unity among the leadership in the congregation. An example of that would be, should we discipline a seriously erring member? Well, obviously that's a very serious issue. It's also an issue on which the Word of God is very clear. There should be discussion on that, but the conclusion is foregone because the authority of the Word of God is already spoken, right? And we should do it with sorrow and after having pursued the restoration of that person. But in the end, it's serious, but it's very clear what we have to do. He says on those issues, there needs to be, the, the church needs, as Dan preached this, month, this morning, we need to have the unity that is single-minded. 
We need to be of one mind. We need to speak the same words. We need to breathe the same air. We need to come to the same conclusions because the Word of God.